Thank you, Professor. The President Xu, Xu Ying, dear Minister Xi Zhenhua, dear Professor Li Zhen, uh, many thanks for inviting me to give this lecture uh, on climate governance in the post-pandemic world here at Tsinghua University. Um, I was smiling looking at the initial, not only remarks, but the presentation of your summer school. And at the same time, I was a little sad as well. I was smiling because I recognized many, many friendly faces. But at the same time, I was sad not to be with you today in physical terms. I have visited China many, many times with many, in many roles as a, um, as an ambassador, as a, as a, of course, a diplomat, but as well as a professor and, and mostly as a friend. So for me, it's a, a very emotional moment to, to, to give this lecture in front of you and hope to have interaction with you. So it, for me, it's a great honor and privilege to be you today and discuss with you a vision for global cooperation, in particular at this uh, historic moment between the EU and China. I would also, of course, thank the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres for his leadership. Uh, we need leadership. Uh, we see this leadership uh, functioning, and I think we should all recognize that we, we need absolutely his leadership on that side. And really, I want to pay tribute to my longtime friend, more 20 years almost, uh, President Chezenoua, because I, I, as he said very, very much, we, we produce a baby to together, the Paris Agreement, and we really have to take care that it just flourish and grow. In this speech, I would like to share my thinking first on the major trends that are shaping the global context on climate and particularly looking at relations between EU, my own home region and China. Of course, I would have preferred to do that in person, but hopefully we can do that very soon. The, co the COVID-19 pandemic has changed the world in a remarkably short period of time. And we are now in the midst of an unprecedented crisis. Antonio Guterres describes this crisis as the uh, health crisis, an economic and the social crisis, and as well an environment crisis. The response to this crisis will shape the future of the global economy for the foreseeable future. Yes. Governments are making massive public investment to alleviate this crisis and will determine the path of the global economy for the many years to come. As such, the speed, scale and content on COVID-19 recovery plan are vital to our ability to achieve the sustainable development goals and deliver on the objective of Paris Agreement. These are two historic agreements that the EU and China played a key role in bringing together in close partnership. It's therefore no exaggeration to say that our ability to leave the future we choose in 2015 will be decided in the next 16 months be between now the COP15 and the, in China and the COP26 of the United Framework Convention on Climate Change are the main milestone we will be facing next year. It is a critical moment for global cooperation. The pandemic has shown us that the big challenge of all our individual countries face, including climate change, cannot be tackled alone if anybody could think differently, which is just the evidence. The pandemic has put out our system of international cooperation under stress. We have to recognize that. Some countries including one of the world's superpowers, the United States, are focused more inwards. If is there a pivotal moment and one where we need both Europe and China as leading region and countries of the world to work together to find pragmatic solution, and it can absolutely convince of this, it can be done. We should rebuild our system of international cooperation, moving from silo diplomatic discussions to a broader approach that integrates the management of the new global commons altogether. EU and China, through their bilateral summit, now projected to be held in December 2020 and through their risk respective recovery plans, have a unique opportunity to lead the world in this direction, especially in the context of the G20, the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund and the World Trade Organization. The foundation are there. The EU and China are both working on a new deep and globally significant plans to guide their economies and society in the future. The European Green Deal and the Chinese ecological civilization, the sustainable recovery, uh, can be the plans that guide us to a more sustainable future. 
Looking at the European Green Deal now, I would like to take a few minutes to explain how I see the European Green Deal and the role it can play in guiding a transition to a sustainable and competitive economy. I think it's a major achievement, an historic moment for Europe, as I think I, I feel. The European Green Deal was proposed by the European Commission in December 2019. It's a roadmap for making the European Union economy sustainable and reaching net zero emissions by 2050. And President Chezenois, as well as Antonio Guterres, UNSG, has showed that this goal of net zero emission by 2050, we want to limit temperature well below 2 degrees C and hopefully 1.5 degrees uh, beyond pre-industrial temperature. Uh, that should be our common goal. It covers the Green Deal, all sectors of the economy, as well as support to help people and regions that are affected by this transition. That's the first time Europe has a, such a comprehensive plan. Climate change now is no more an a silo action of the European economy. It's now a, a cross-cutting issue that every sector has to contribute to. Even in the face of the COVID-19 health and economic crisis, the EU has committed to pushing this path. And I am re re relieved by this decision that we have taken very recently. Europe has said clearly that no matter what other countries choose to do, this is the direction it will go in. And it's very important to have this, uh, in a way, this belief that Europe has decided that the future has to be green and sustainable. Europe has done this because its citizens have demanded it and because they see that it is in their economic interest. There is unprecedented public awareness and concern about climate change in Europe, which has been a major driver for change. 93 of Europeans consider climate change as a serious problem, and they are voting based on this concern. There was a green wave in the 2019 European election and green wave in the local election that France just held. Millions of Europeans, especially young people, have also taken the streets over the last year to demand more climate action from politicians. European actors at all levels all see that the need to act on climate is a new economic reality. Clean technology and services are considered smart investment. Fossil fuel are at risk of becoming stranded assets over the next decade. And it's even you see that in the value of the share of many fossil fuel companies this, uh, these last days. Major companies have embarked on the transformation to sustainable production and climate neutrality. From big global players like Shell to leading car companies like VW, companies see this transition is coming and they are setting targets and plans. If this is a direction of travel, it is their competitive advantage to act now and be in the lead. Investors and shareholders are also applying more scrutiny on investment and development choices of companies. Economic voices like Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England, are telling us that ignoring climate change puts the financial system at risk and also that the net zero global is a major commercial opportunity. The EU head of states and government this weekend decided on the European financial priority for the next seven years and as a response to COVID-19, unanimously they agreed that 30% of the one point a trillion euro package in total 550 billion euros should be spent to finance climate action. The rest of the investment should do no harm to the environment and be allocated in line with the goals of Paris Agreement. The 550 billion euros should support the transition set out in the Green Deal. They can flow into e-mobility infrastructure, creating local green jobs for housing, renovation or renewable energy and help adjust transition. This is a significant political signal on how Europe plans a resilient and green recovery. Again, as a long time diplomat, as a professor, I can say that the first time I see European Union so united behind beyond that target. It is supported my major European economy, of course, as you know, as Germany, France, Spain and Italy, which is a clear benefit of supporting the low carbon sectors at the national level and create good jobs for the future. But even countries that rely still heavily on coal I decided just to go to just to change their energy mix and go for cleaner energy. The Green Deal and cooperation on climate and environment will be a major item on Europe's international agenda in the next 18 months. German Chancellor Merkel set out clear priority for the EU and the German presidency for the next six months. The theme is to strive for a unified, sustainable and future-oriented recovery 
in which climate, digitalization and the EU global responsibility will be prioritized. Germany and the EU are preparing to play a stronger role as an assertive and responsible climate leader. They will make this framework the guiding star internationally to recover so the COVID-19 crisis in a way that also addresses the ecological and climate emergencies. In my view, and having heard again uh, President Xi Zenua, I, I see this is a key area of EU and China to cooperate. EU and China share an equally important commitment to sustainable development. And that's very important. They phrase and frame it in different ways based on different contexts and political culture. The European Green Deal and the Chinese ecological civilization concept, however, meet through their ultimate objective, achieving net zero greenhouse gas emission, protecting biodiversity, and achieving sustainable and equitable development for all. Translating this on the international stage by turning the EU-China summit into a cornerstone for sustainable recovery requires concrete and operational commitment put into the political framework on a renewed strategic partnership between the EU and China, which clearly has to signal to the rest of the world the direction they intend to take. When it comes to concrete commitments ahead of COP26, the EU and China should both increase their NDC for 2030 to a level that is consistent with the Paris goal and objective of reaching net zero GHG emission in 2050 for the EU soon after for China. In the case of EU, this means increasing its current 2030 target from 45% emission reduction from compared to 1990 to emission reduction target to 55%. What precisely the Chinese 2030 target should be is a matter for China to decide. It can be achieved in multiple and non-exclusive ways, advancing the date for the peaking of carbon emission, reducing its coal cap further and adding a carbon cap tightening the carbon intensity and energy intensity target, increasing the non-fossil fuel energy target, including non-carbon emission into its target, backing of all these economy-wide targets with sectoral targets like electrification of, the, of transport, etc. The work that China is doing to classify the climate impacts of investment, particularly in the Belt and Road Initiative, will be an important tool as well, again, in this EU-China cooperation. The move by the People's Bank of China to remove so-called clean coal from the list of projects eligible for green bonds is a very, very encouraging and interesting first step. But whatever specific tool and target China chooses, the next five-year plan should put China on a trajectory that is consistent with this objective of reaching zero GIG emissions after 2050. And that will be, in a way, this parallel conversation with European economy. The EU-China summit should also include some outcome on trade and investment. Talking about trade in the context of environmental protection often lead to some misunderstanding. And I, I would like to use that channel of conversation to, to try to improve the understanding on both sides. The EU Green Deal is clear about the EU intention to go along with the carbon border tax adjustment mechanism. This is clear and widely shared support from such a measure in Europe. But what does it, it meant through a BTA is not protectionism disguised as an environmental protection measure. The European BTA is conceived as one among other tools to implement the Green Deal, in particular in sector heavily exposed to international cooperation. But very frankly and in an honest way, I don't think the EU should not go alone. I don't think the EU should go alone unilaterally with the implementation of the BTA. The attempt, for example, of including international aviation within the European emission trading scheme unilaterally was, in my view, a mistake. Rather, the EU should discuss with China first the establishment of a BTA against countries that has not ratified the Paris Agreement and are not delivering on their commitments. Europe is always also looking closely at sustainable fin finance as an area of cooperation. Europe will seek to provide its climate finance and support to other countries in a way that helps them transition to climate neutrality and recover better from COVID-19. With the EU taxonomy, a groundbreaking instrument to classify economic activities in accordance to their sustainability, and uh, it, it makes me think that China has started away its own criteria and standard. I will come back to this later. EU also has a potential to set a global standard on the other hand. While only binding for European market participants, international actors are 
already closely watching the EU progress on the taxonomy, including Malaysia, Australia, Canada, Japan, all of which are working on classification systems themselves. And I know that China has been working on criteria and standards to define green finance, both internally and for the Belt and Road Initiative. So it will be so interesting and impactful to have a cooperation on how to develop green finance between the two. Finance is an important area as well for global cooperation when it comes to support for other countries, also hit very hard by the COVID crisis. China and the EU can emphasize the need for all countries to have access to fiscal space, debt alleviation measures, support for recovery investment in sustainable development. In Europe, for example, we are looking at potential debt for nature swaps. It could be an interesting development and mechanism to explore further, in particular for the biodiversity summit that China is hosting. Globally, as I've already said, I feel it's a challenging time for global cooperation. While the EU and China do not share the same perspective on every issue, they share some important principles and values. That puts them in a unique position to deliver on this objective and lead the world to a new ethos of cooperation. EU and China share a strong commitment to a multilateral rule-based system. Global problems call for global solution and international cooperation. The COVID pandemic and the climate and biodiversity crisis are two clear examples of those. As obvious as these statements may sound, it is unfortunately not shared by all, in particular not by the current U.S. administration. A victory by Joe Biden in the upcoming U.S. presidential election would certainly change many things for the better when it comes to international relations and climate action and mark a return to U.S. some political leadership on climate. But unfortunately, the U.S. attitude toward China is unlikely to change much, at least in substance, as a campaign and polling of U.S. opinion make it clear. And the EU, I'm concerned about the public opinion shifting toward a more defensive stance toward China. But it can and should absolutely go back up if an effective and meaningful agreement is forged between the EU and China this fall. I'm concerned by throughout the world that to see nationalism is on the rise. This is a very dangerous trend that needs to be reversed through a more honest public debate decisive political action and enhanced cooperation. We really have to understand each other in a much more deep way, understand the concerns and see where we can join action together. Climate is an ideal issue. In my view, it's one of the major issues which we can build this new spirit and form a global cooperation. Rather than thinking of a recovery plan as well as the upcoming major negotiation on climate, hosted by the UK and on biodiversity, hosted by China as separate tracks, I do feel that we should broaden our cooperation to a, a diplomacy built around the Green Deal and the ecological civilization. civilization. Ecological re recovery plan with short, mid and long-term milestones can serve as a basis for discussion between countries. These plans can be the centerpiece of the reconstruction of the international system on both biodiversity and climate, and more broadly. Understanding the interconnection and changing our development models in all countries is necessary to end the trade wars and ensure a sustainable and prosperous future for all, which is a condition for peace. It's time for the world to come together again to forge a new approach for leaders with vision and courage together with their citizens to design the system needed to safeguard our shared future. That moment may be closer and more real than we realize, one where China can play a major role in the next two years, we have an opportunity to mend a broken system, restore a damaged planet, rebuild a social contract in nation, and reinvent the global governance system. Reaching a truly meaningful agreement, one that it is indeed at the height of the historic time we live in, requires going outside of the comfort zone of everyone. This is true for both from EU and China. Both, but true leadership comes at this cost and with this price. The EU and China have everything it takes to not only ensure a speedy recovery from the COVID-19 crisis, but also to set the world on a new path to a green, sustainable and equitable future. A future that will not only benefit the global public good, but also, and first among them, the leaders and citizens who decide to take the next bold step. President Xi Jinping, dear professors and dear esteemed audience, dear students, because Indeed, my, my preferred role is to be a professor. With this, I would like to conclude. I remain at your 
disposal for further question now, but also in the future, as I am convinced that China and Europe can learn from each other, increase the understanding of each other's development shores and cooperate on the transition. Again, consider me as a longtime friend of China and really eager to, to develop our discussion all together. Thank you for your attention and looking forward to hear your, your feedback and question. Thank you.